Continue to try, never give up. Fight till the end. All right, so welcome to London in the United Kingdom with uh, Inco. And we're very happy to join CAFRA and our friends in, the, in Asia and around the world, because I know people are watching this in uh, many countries, including Norway and, uh, and uh, all over the world. So um, we're all excited to be here. We're gonna have a conversation using an open conference concept that I've used in the past we have a, a table, I'm the facilitator, so I'm Charles Gardner with INCO, and we have uh, five people at the table and one empty seat. So we'll start a conversation. I will randomly think of some question and see if we can get a conversation going. In my experience, this crowd has no problems speaking, <laughs> and <laughs> it's hard to shut them up, And uh, but speak. And then and, uh, at any point in time, anyone in the audience can come up and sit in the empty chair. When that happens, someone who's been at the table before needs to politely and respectfully get up and leave. And it's amazing how well that works um, because we're all polite. And, uh, and it, you know, inevitably somebody says, well, okay, I said enough and, and off we go. So, um, so <coughs> we can start, we can start. Um, uh, Frank, why did you make this journey? all the way to London. I make this journey all the way to London because my biggest concern is all the people who smoke today. And, and, um, and that makes me, it makes me worry. It, it, it's even, even take my, my sleep away. Uh, when I think about what the WHO are doing um my experience so far is that who is philip morris best friend they help philip morris sell more cigarettes to kill more people mm. and i would try to avoid that that's why uh, we had taken a trip from norway to london to speak to who to speak to the de delegates at cop 9 um, as you all know, we try to speak to the delegates from Norway that is participating at COP9. Um, they listened to what we told them, but they didn't believe us. Um, they were very polite. Uh, we had an hour conversation with them. Um, we, we said our arguments and, and they answered, we don't believe you. And that that's that scares me. That 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 take my 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 sleep away actually. Mm. And and um, yeah, that's why I'm here. Okay, and tell us your full name and, and your organization, just so everyone yeah. knows. Yeah, my name is Frank. Uh, I, I I stick to my first name because my second name is so crazy that no one would <laughs> believe what it is. So I'm Frank, and I re I represent NDS. Um, the consumer group from Norway and uh, we came down to London with six persons from our board and one of our members so uh, yeah that's that's us okay great any anybody want to jump in yeah sure okay um Richard Perrin and I represent Safer Nicotine Wiki um, the reason I came here was uh, basically to try and get the message across to uh, the COP9 delegates that they need to take tobacco harm reduction seriously and tobacco is killing 8 million people a year and it doesn't need to be that way. We, we've got some pretty good solutions now with tobacco harm reduction, vaping, snooze, heat not burn. And I just believe that we can make a real difference to people all around the world, even in low and middle income countries where 
the WHO are saying they should be banning tobacco harm reduction. That's just ridiculous. It's like has been said before, it's literally killing people. It's unbelievable. You wouldn't think that in the modern age such a thing could happen. Anyone else? You're here. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm here just because I think... Your name and, and your organization. Yeah, of course. Nina, and uh, from Norway and representing NDS. Um, I think the work that uh, INCO is doing uh, is very fine. Um, so I wanted to come to support the stuff that you're doing here now. Yeah, just that. Good. And uh, Claude Bamberger, I represent uh, French uh, Vapors. And um, I came to London first to to say how grateful we are to uh, England, because a lot of people from the administrations, from the research here, uh, have done a, a great work. The other thing is, uh, when you watch the Eurobarometer, You've got two countries in Europe, extended Europe, <laughs> that uh, have uh, twice the number of new ex-smokers, twice the success against tobacco smoking, than the rest of Europe. And those two countries are the most tolerant uh, uh, around vaping. They, Work on tolerant. that. T T tolerant. tolerant. That yeah, because for, for example, in France, uh, vaping is accepted. We've got a lot of vape shops, we've got a lot of vapors, and ex vapors mm. as well. We now mm. have far more uh, ex smokers, ex vapors than vapors. It's a continuum, and often people forget to count those who quit smoking, then quit vaping. Uh, and that's the aim, just to help people uh, quit Have smoking. Have you seen a ranking of countries by their rates of smoking decline or increase? I've, I've found that's very difficult to find. Well, uh, <laughs> those figures, I have to I mean, we, calculate them we think, by myself. Because we think of... smoking is, is plummeting in Norway. It is. Yeah, uh, right. And we know it has gone down. In yeah, Norway. yeah, yeah. So you're saying it's falling faster than average in France? Oh yeah, it, it, it's falling like it didn't for the last 20 years. It's so accelerated. It, yeah, it, it's huge. <laughs> of course, we have the example, the, the grandparents of uh, Sweden. Uh, we have the success of Norway. Mm. Uh, we have some other countries that are doing great. But we don't take uh, indicators, we don't take figures correctly in uh, the common use the papers around uh, how to reduce smoking. It's like uh, how to reduce the number of cigarettes bought mm. in shops. That, that's not an indicator, that's a re relative proxy that's very interesting. The important thing is to see how people stop smoking. And the other country that where smoking rates in Europe are falling fastest is the UK. Yeah, this is, this is it, it, it's right? even in. It's difficult to calculate exactly, but it's going down faster than France, at least, um, because other efforts already took place before. The, the World Health Organization gives out awards for the countries that are most compliant with their recommendations. So, Empower recommendations, FCTC recommendations. How, how different would it look if they gave out awards for countries that had the fastest rates of smoking decline? <laughs> yeah. That's a tricky question. And why don't they? Why don't they? Yeah. yeah. Japan would be there. Of course. Of of course. Burn or HTPs. Korea. Korea. And, yeah. So I think we'd see a very UK different. Would probably be right up there as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just from the amount of people I've seen myself. Uh, uh, oh, an anecdotes? Anecdotes? Oh, uh, yeah. Just because of the amount of people I've seen mm. 
myself switch from smoking to vaping, most <laughs> smokers out there, given the chance of a safer alternative, will switch. There are some hardened smokers who just like smoking and right. that's that. But given the opportunity of something 95% safer or 95% mm. at least safer, then most smokers will actually take the opportunity to, to give it a try at least. And the number of people I've seen switch from smoking to vaping is quite astounding. And we've not seen the uptick in youth vaping. There hasn't been any real um, uptake in vaping of non-smokers either. So all of this panic that seems to be going on at the moment it seems to be completely unfounded. It's just FUD. Fear, uncertainty, doubt. Ah. Yes. Anyone else? Do you want to name and My name is uh, Trond Meyer. I'm uh, chairman of the NDS, Norwegian Union of Vapors. Uh, we are here to show COP9 uh, and the WHO that uh, vaping works with examples from UK. We also want to show our uh, Norwegian health department that um, the proposed ban on uh, flavors and the age limit, 25 years, is uh, wrong. And um, yeah, that's why we put six people here to join you. Okay, great, thank you. Claude, I interrupted you. Did, did you want to complete a thought? Uh, we'd have a, a yes. Okay, so we have a question from Skip Murray. Now, who the heck is that? Um, <laughs> my dear Skip, uh, we are uh, so happy you're watching. And uh, the question is simply, what was the turnout in London? I would, uh, if anybody wants to correct me, but I'd say that by the time we had additional people coming uh, through the day, probably at 25 or 30. <clears throat> So, and most, many of them are, are here in the room to, to today. So it's three o'clock in the afternoon here um, in London. Uh, this evening we have um, an event with uh, a member of parliament coming, a, a BBC commentator and a reception um, and, um, and skip an award will be given to the Safer Nicotine Wiki team for their contributions to the field of tobacco harm reduction. And I'll give it to this guy. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. I just want to say hi, Skip. Hi, Skip. Hi, Skip. Hello. Skip. <laughs> nice seeing you. Hi, Skip. We love you. <laughs> Skip's our hero. Jeez. That's, uh, that's great. So, uh, so um, Atakan has joined. Then, okay. Tron goes. Thank you for your contributions. Right. What do you want to say? Well, I just wanted to chip in on the notion of the indicators that Claude was talking about. And I'm Atakan Befritz. I'm from NNA Sweden and also have the honor to serve on the Secretariat for INCO, Global INCO. Um, I think we've seen that for quite a long time. And it, I would say, I would argue that a lot of the blame for this actually is to be blamed on my country to begin with, because the indicators mm. for what is effective and what isn't effective in terms of outcomes is something that we have studiously avoided doing at all for the past 35 years in Sweden. So there's, there's no culture of what kind of questions should we be asking in our surveys? What are good proxies indicators for outcomes? And we don't have that. We don't have any practice in doing it. So none of the other countries that are going about this now actually have anything to stand on, anything to go by in terms of an easy, easy copy paste. So you're saying that, um, for example, the Karolinska Institute has never sat down and tried to figure out what is the relative risk of snus versus uh, smoking a cigarette? No, I would say that's probably one of the worst problems that we have and that can be attributed to this is that there is no real calculation or estimation of the relative risk 
of smoking and using snus. There are some. Right. There's a, the Australian uh, study. Um, anyway, I, you know, where we have these graphs where you're, they're relative risks. But I'm you know. sure there are. Um, and if you use them, we and we sort of also end up with snus at 3.6 percent, something like that, of the risk of of um, smoking, which then would mean we have 30 odd thousand zombies in Sweden, people that are actually dead, <laughs> but just who aren't dead because they aren't dead. Somebody should, should tell them. <laughs> yes, yes, roll over and, and go away. Exactly, but that, that, that's actually that's a real issue, and uh -huh. not having that pinpointed as well as possible is egregiously bad, according to me. Because we started in the UK in 2015, I think the first one came, mm. and they are fine tuning where the needle goes for vaping, and it hasn't changed outside the range of of at least 95%, likely much more, is what I've gotten since then. That needle we should have had in Sweden from circa 1985, and we should have fine-tuned that to perfection by now. And the only thing we say is we don't have enough science. The public health is very, very conservative, uh, especially on when it comes to harms. And so what, one of the things that occurs to me is that if, if you just go back in history 30 years or so, you get back into the 1990s and HIV AIDS activists in, in some ways, I mean, nicotine is a lot more benign than, than uh, HIV AIDS, right? Let's, <laughs> let's just state that. And they're different, but there's, uh, there are a lot of similarities. And, but I want to point out that one of the top items on the agenda for, for HIV AIDS activists was changing the research priorities. Yes. We don't, think very much about that. So, so there are research questions that, that actually we would like to know about the relative risks that aren't not being really asked and, or you know, about benefits as well that aren't being asked or Ab ignored. Absolutely. And that, that is part and parcel of the problem that we are also not really questioned, we that are experts in as, as consumer laymen experts in how to quit what happened to us and what happened to our friends. We are not asked by scientists to join in, weigh in, and we have probably the best material in the world from mainly Claude and some other notables to the fantastic job. We have 37,000 replies from consumers of which 35,000 are in the EU. And that is material that is free to use. And I don't think we've had very many questions from science asking, can we yeah. use your raw data? No, no, we propose them. <laughs> so what, what we think, how we feel, what we do and what works just seems to be of absolutely <clears throat> no consequence whatsoever, except for here in the UK. I, I will point out that HIV AIDS activists actually succeeded in getting a voice in the setting of research priorities, um, having a seat at the table on this research decision making in, in actually many high income countries. Um, one, uh, one drug harm reduction person pointed out to me at the first GFM I went to that, you know, your problem is nicotine just isn't harmful enough to, to capture that much attention, which I've all, I always go back and think about, but they succeeded. I, I think that needs to be part of our, our priorities. Agreed. Changing research priorities. priorities is our priority. Agreed. But the problem is when, when we talk to politicians and civil servants uh, and what we always meet as an argue uh, against us is it's the nicotine. We don't want to talk to you. We don't want anything to do with you. And you ask why? It's, it's the nicotine. And they always compare the nicotine that's in their eyes tobacco. Mm -hmm. We find that as a, that's the biggest problem we have at least. They can't, they can't see oh, the difference. Take the, take the thingy. I'm not speaking. I'm, I'm giving it <laughs> to Frank. Oh. Yeah. <coughs> As I said, the, the biggest problem is that politicians don't see the difference between nicotine and tobacco. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, when we try to say safe in nicotine, they almost laugh at you and ask, what is safe in nicotine? Mm -hmm. What are you talking about? Nicotine is tobacco, period. I found that very difficult and 
very problematic. And you explain there are nicotine patches and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, nicotine gum. Yeah, no, uh, let's let, 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 let me say one thing about Norway and nicotine pouches. Um, a company I won't n n name the name um, uh, tried to start selling nicotine pouches in Norway a few years ago, and our government said, no, 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 that's not allowed to sell. But if you put tobacco in it, <laughs> then you are allowed to sell it. <laughs> because we have a law, I, I don't remember the exact year, but it was in, in the 70s. They said that in 1972, there is not allowed to get a new nicotine product into the market in Norway. So when they tried to start selling nicotine pouches, uh, they said, no, but put nicotine in it then you will be allowed to, to, to sell it. Make, yeah, yeah, make, tobacco it in. make it a homeopathic level of nicotine <laughs> diluted yeah. 10,000 times. Would yeah. Work? yeah, that would work. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Right. Yeah. Problem solved. Yeah. Again, on that note, I think that has been a strategy uh, working in different ways all around Europe and all around the world. So you have had most of the current producers of nicotine pouches have had versions of them that are mainly tobacco, a little bit of something else, mainly something else and a little bit of tobacco, or then as now going all pure, extracting from tobacco fiber and injecting into wheat fiber or whatever else kind of plant fiber that you like. And then suddenly, you know, sim salabim, you've created something new and, I mean, we talked about that at GFN in 2016, and I think I, I refer to it as loophole surfing. Mm. And that is good for public health in terms of getting it into the market and allowing people, those who know, to switch, mm -hmm. but not so very useful in terms of, of easing concerns from the regulators, from the nations, from the governments. And that's understandable. And that, that is a, that, that's a goal conflict that we have all the time trying to get the product in because mm -hmm. that's what companies do and you have to have them in for people to be able to use them but at mm -hmm. the same time if you then cut corners when you're doing that that in itself creates a new set of problems that we also really don't need to have everyone sitting at the table here is from a high income country yes what what are the i mean just reflect on possibilities of nicotine pouches and, and snus for low-income countries to, to help, you know, displace smoking? I suppose that one. I mean, I've, I've spoken to several people from low and middle-income countries. Um, Joseph Mangaro, mm -hmm. for Mar one. Mangaro, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, for one. And... Um, for them, e-cigs aren't really an option because they're too expensive. The the cost of actually buying the, the gear out front is too much. Mm -hmm. But nicotine pouches are cheap to produce. They're easy to produce. They can be made locally. That could yeah. be a game changer. That is one of the problems that I see with them. That the, sorry. So just a minor addition. And I really hope there's a way to for, for industry to come up with a solution to this problem because that would be good. I would I would applaud that. To my knowledge, and I did this a few years ago with, with um, Carl Phillips uh, from the US, looked at what could actually be made financially possible for every single person in the world who today can afford to use some form of toxic tobacco. Right? And that would actually be basically cottage industry sized production of snus made from real tobacco, mm -hmm. which you could have cottage sized local in the different, you know, perfectly adapted to the different palates and tastes all over the world. And that are, that can be produced to price points that anyone who can afford to smoke can afford to use. And that's the only one. The pouches, the plants you need to, when you get up to scale, fine, then it's, then they are dirt cheap, but then you only have a few producers that are up to scale and then they own or control that market. And there isn't very much budget pouches around the world 
as of yet. It's all pretty much premium. And I would imagine shareholders demanding of larger corporations that they should concentrate on those markets first in the LMIC. So, you know, Lahore, and the, big, the bigger cities where you have huge populations of middle, age, middle income people. Yes. But we're not going to see it trickle down to the poorest of the poor unless we make it dirt cheap and dirt simple. I'm afraid. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, I mean, I can see, and we've tried it safe for nicotine wiki to, to kind of take the, um, the benefits of nicotine and separate them from the harms of smoking. And we've got pages and pages of information there on the possible benefits that nicotine, I mean, as, as somebody who's neurodiverse myself, I use nicotine to treat my symptoms. And there are lots of people who do the same thing. Um, it's important that we, we kind of get away from the conflation of tobacco with nicotine. We need to separate the two somehow. And I don't know how we go about doing that. Um, as others have said, it's really difficult to kind of get people to talk about nicotine without them thinking tobacco. And we need to we need to do something about that. I don't know how we do. Well, uh, Judy Gibson from the Inco Secretariat. Hi, Skip. Um, <laughs> uh, Richard, uh, you're absolutely right. And actually, it's exactly what Frank said uh, is this idea. And yet, um, actually, it's the idea of any form of addiction at all that's a problem. It's the word addiction mm. as opposed to de uh, dependency. And so when you look at the, uh, the people who are particularly anti-e-cigarettes, what they're saying is, you know, we are literally letting young people be a slave and an addict to nicotine. So in that sense, the problem isn't whether you call it tobacco or nicotine. You know, in that sense, mm. it is the idea that it's so heinous that you would actually keep enjoying something in a reasonable quantity that is relatively harmless. That's not the point. The fact that you enjoy it and keep wanting to do it is the problem. Coffee is fine. Alcohol mm. in moderation is absolutely fine. Do you have any thoughts on the, the mm. issue that Richard raised on neurodiversity um, and the argument that many smokers are self-medicated? Well, I mean, I, I'm neurodiverse as well. I mean, I've had um, ADHD, uh, well, presumably all my life, but, you know, I wasn't aware of it at the age of one. Um, but um, I think I've just got a little note here from, from Attigan. Not fun enough. Nicotine. It's not fun? It's not fun enough. Oh, no, you mean as opposed to like all going out to the pub and having a drink and getting saying like, getting slashed. Unfortunately, nicotine doesn't intoxicate. No. Right? It's, it's no. a really lousy no. drug. Yeah. In fact, you don't actually change <laughs> people. <laughs> nicotine in and of itself is just as dangerous as smoking, and it's not even fun. So no. who on you for being such a bad person and yeah, yeah, costing yeah. the world lots of money? But that's okay, that's Com coming back to this, this point, are we talking enough about the... Um, the the, the kind of this concept of therapeutic nicotine. No, no, yeah. no, and I and I think no, we're not. And uh, violent the fact, fa well, the, the fact that there are so many. I mean, people say, you know, there's a real problem that, and it is a problem. But you know, uh, that in psychiatric hospitals and mental health uh, places in uh, prisons, where, as we know, at least fifty percent of the community, if not more actually suffer from some form of urinalversity, it could well be 70. And it's not that because they have a gene to be bad, or in fact, they happen to have, it's actually, they smoke because it helps in some way. Mm. And nobody's put the two together because mm. they said, well, no, that's just because of their sort of bad living or the fact that they have mental health problems. So they don't know the difference. I mean, it's scandalous. 
it, it actually just occurred to me that many people watching may not, it, English may not be their first language. So when, and this concept neuro neurodiversity is, is relatively new for some English speakers too. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about adults who are living with attention deficit disorder, autism, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, Tourette's syndrome, a variety of um, uh, mental health conditions that people can be very high functioning. <laughs> Uh, perfectly many, high functioning and on, on a spectrum and yeah and even sitting at this table and, uh, <laughs> and um and 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 they all of these conditions people are smoking at much higher rates than the general population this has been known for decades and it's much harder for them to quit because nicotine helps them okay and the idea that it just turns nicotine on its head there's a it's a, a demon drug because it's addictive or it's a therapeutic with a, with a nicotine patch, for example, because most of the studies that show this are anyway. So I yeah. No, no, I, no, I'm, I'm just agreeing with you really. You know, I sometimes do not, but in this occasion, I agree a hundred percent. I would actually just like to say, because I, I was listening to the introductions as to why people came here and everything else and the wonderful Norwegians. And I think, I must say it isn't, I mean, we had 25, but to say we had 25 people um, when we are in a COVID situation with things rising all the time, there are a lot of people that didn't come simply because, because of that. they couldn't yeah. because they were with elderly relatives mm -hmm. or they had elderly relatives living or because frankly, uh, or because the government, this the UK government didn't recognize the vaccine they had had uh, or there was a visa problem, we would have had somebody from um, Thailand come. Uh, Asa yeah. would have come, we would have had people from Africa. Uh, and I'd just like to say thank you, for, you know, as the member um, director for, for INCO, thank you so much for the people that did come because I, I think it was a big give. And all those vaccinations, the, the second day tests and the filling in forms, they don't make it easy, I, I know. So I'd like to say thank you, that's, that's well, my bit. Yeah, okay. I've agreed. And there were many, many, I don't need it up. I have a clip of things. Okay. Um, there were many, many more people who wanted to come and either couldn't get the, the COVID test or the visa or the, you know, whatever. Um, so we, if it wasn't for the pandemic, we would be a larger crowd, but we, I think we've done pretty well with, with the conditions. We all had to come in and get tested immediately after entry and a um, lot of documentation because of the pandemic. Just like to go back to the the point about um, nicotine not being all bad. Uh, there's a couple of hundred studies, I think, on Safer Nicotine Wiki. Uh, our page on nicotine benefits, and somehow we need to hammer that home that nicotine isn't all bad. Mm -hmm. That outside of tobacco smoking. You know, it helps people, it makes people better, it makes them feel better, it makes them able to interact better. It certainly helps me to interact better with other people when I've got some nicotine in my system because it treats the symptoms of my autism and ADHD. And it makes me able to focus and concentrate and actually lead a better life somehow we need to make that point more clearly. I, I've been to that page. Um, which of you would like to go? I've been to that page of the Safer Nicotine Wiki and I can uh, recommend it highly to anyone who wants to take a look at and just do the search for nicotine benefits. And it's really quite astonishing. And it's, it's not just the ADHD and autism and so on. It's also for Parkinson's disease. It's for rheumatoid arthritis. And it, it's like, it, you know, it's a, it's a kind of a, in a way it starts to look like a wonder drug the same way people claim cannabis is a wonder drug, right? Yeah, but, but perhaps uh, depending on the countries and the tobacco consumption background, we, we have different ideas of uh, the, the benefits because of course, in countries where very few people smoke, especially in the young population, perhaps it's difficult to understand that new people could, could use a, uh, 
you could use nicotine. But for example, in France, uh, basically vaping also reduced smoking in teens. And basically smoking in teens is so common. We are 25% of uh, uh, daily smokers at the end of uh, high school, 25%. 50% of uh, teens have smoked. So basically, talking about <laughs> we must protect them from nicotine is we must protect tobacco because half of them <laughs> will use tobacco. Uh, and perhaps we could, that, that's basic logic, that mm. if they know, just know, that there is something else. If they know that there are condoms <laughs> before the first time. If they know there are a safer nicotine products, <clears throat> of course, there is vaping, but not only. Um, this could avoid the first 100 cigarettes. Uh, after 100 cigarettes, the, the statistics in the past, because there weren't a lot of alternatives, <laughs> but uh, people were going to, to smoke for the rest of their lives in, in maturity. Uh, saying we can cut this 100 is also and should be one of the major targets in uh, reducing smoking, reducing from the start and then reducing the, the rest because it, it won't work for everybody. And we see that in all solutions, mm. it does not work for everybody. Let's add a new door out of smoking. The first one is not entering anyway. But there is also not entering smoking, which change a lot of things, and we observe that in um, which make the the story because that's a story uh, of a plan to addict young people. Uh, what we see in the stats, it it will be the worst marketing ever uh, when you see how many uh, teens try and how many continue. Basically, <laughs> we, we are at uh, uh, less than 1% non-smokers in France and after 10 years, and a general availability of uh, vaping. And it's the same for the youth. There, there is no more, there is even less young people uh, vaping. And 99.x uh, <laughs> percent uh, are ex-smokers already, because we forget that we have ex-smokers that are 15. Mm. Mm. And the, it's huge. The uh, point on the, on the condoms, uh, actually, maybe Rob wants to speak to no. first. I think he had a hand up first. But the, oh, the yeah. point on the condoms is interesting because <coughs> making them available to school children um, in the United States was a, a, a subject of a previous moral panic. Um, because that would obviously cause teen sex. And it oh didn't. My God. Yeah, <laughs> it didn't. I mean, there, there is teen sex. I mean, teen, that happens, teen sex. But, yes. um, but it didn't increase it. Um, and, but, the, but the same arguments were, were made there. You know, I, I you know, think about I, in, in traditional tobacco control, there's this assumption that if a new product comes into the market, even if it's a safer product, that will just increase overall nicotine use and tobacco use. Whereas that's a failure to understand the product substitution. Mm. It's more like a zero sum game, right? Uh, like the, the, the assumption is, oh, we have more variety of products that's going to lead to more use. And it's not the case. No. Anyway, and people sorry, Rob. Clinging to the gateway effect. Oh my God, how, how long is that one going to hang on? <laughs> How long is that going to hang on, Rob? Uh, oh, and I, may, I will introduce myself. Uh, Rob de Lange um, from ECVODA, the Dutch consumer organization. I held, hold the chair there. And I also have the distinct honor of serving as vice president for the governing board of INCO. Um, the problem, I think, uh, stems from the fact that um, tobacco control has always uh, come from sort of a moral high ground. They weren't about facts. They were about morals and nicotine has been their scapegoat forever and it worked for them it really worked and everyone well almost everyone in the general public thinks that nicotine is bad for you now we know and we've known for a long time that isn't that it isn't the case 
because nicotine was prescribed in patches and gums and long jeans and somehow it magically became safe um, except when used in tobacco and now we've got an alternative um, not based on tobacco and now they've got a problem because now they've got to admit that well actually maybe they choose the wrong scapegoat mm. and tell people who want control and who are in power um, that they should come out and say well sorry we got it wrong it ain't never gonna happen um, so eventually a maybe they will look at it a bit different mm. but they never they in my opinion will never um, own up to the fact that well maybe they got it a bit wrong in 20 in early 2018 the Food and Drug Administration in the United States was they announced that they were developing a public service announcement campaign that would inform the public that nicotine does not cause cancer, heart, or lung disease. It was part of uh, Gottlieb's plan to, to shift to a zero or nearly zero nicotine combustible deadly cigarette and then still have the e-cigarettes and people would shift. Then uh, the uh, data came in from the National Youth Tobacco Survey, which um, by June of 2018, they knew the data and they decided that there was a teen vaping epidemic. So they, they canceled that, that plan. So it was a plan to um, correct gross misperceptions in the public and physicians, and they decided not to implement the plan. So they, think of the logic of that, just ethically. How, well, in, in, out? on a smaller scale in the Netherlands, we've got exactly the same problem. Um, we've got a flavor ban hanging uh, above our heads and all the signs are on green that it will go through. We even now got the list of the 31 uh, supposedly permitted chemicals, uh, flavoring chemicals that can be used and all the others can't be used. Hmm. Um, and that will come into legislation somewhere, for, probably before the end of this year. Hmm. Um, and what we wait, wait a moment. Yeah. Let me have ask you a question about flavor. They yeah. say that they're going to ban flavors. Yeah. You're going to only have tobacco. Yeah. What is tobacco taste made of? Um, they actually flavors? They, they identified 31 flavor compounds. So the individual compounds that had something to do that were associated with the flavor of tobacco. And those 31 are the supposedly allowed flavorings and they had f four criteria to select and i'll tell you it's 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 insane when you hear it but it's true and i can show you the documents the flavoring compound had to be used in at least 0.5 percent of all liquids sold in the netherlands which were claimed to be a tobacco flavor that was one of the criteria and <laughs> I see everybody saying that, but yes, it, it's just insane. Um, and um, there were a few other. Uh, um, can, can you produce a liquid with just one of those flavors or three of them and call it a tobacco flavor? I mean, you can you can call it anything, right? But whether it tastes actually like a stinky cigarette or not is, is a different matter, right? And the compounds they now uh, have on the list, mm. and you can create liquids with them, mm. and they would be considered uh, tasting like tobacco liquids. There's no, yet no uh, guideline on how much of each can be used and how many you can mix and match and whatever. Yeah. If, I, if I gave you guys <laughs> sitting around the table, I gave you, I, I put a bottle of tobacco flavor on the table, and I ask each one of you to smell it. I can guarantee you that you will tell me five different flavors. Some of you would say chocolate. I smell chocolate. I smell vanilla. So I, I ask, what is tobacco flavor? Beats me. <laughs> the, the, the strange thing is with this is that what it really boils down to, um, and I think we all as vapors and ex-smokers made that journey the first thing we did when we switched to vaping, well, at least let's talk for myself. I searched for a tobacco flavor. I wanted something that tasted exactly like the cigarettes I was smoking. Mm. Yes, but it can't yeah. Be did done. any of you find that one? Nobody right. did. 
because you're uh, searching for the, uh, the taste of burning tobacco, yeah. of the smoke out of burning tobacco. You're not after the taste of tobacco because no one is chewing their cigarettes or, or, or well, doing other nasty things with them. They're, they're lighting them and they're inhaling the smoke. So um, the taste of tobacco and what is it? You've got Virginia tobacco, Latakia tobacco. There are so many forms of tobacco and a lot of um, tobaccos um, have flavors added to them. Yeah. Right. To, to to make it more palatable or, or, or. No, one, one of one of the myths that used to be out there was that flavors and that's i always put it in quotation marks so what they really mean by flavors is fruit or dessert or candy flavor but the flavors are added to mask the harsh taste of nicotine yeah that's rubbish nicotine <laughs> doesn't taste of anything no okay but they so there's an assumption there that the molecule nicotine it itself has a tobacco flavor. And I, I wonder how, I haven't seen that argument made recently, except in one place a couple of weeks ago, but specifically because I was searching for that, that particularly stupid statement. And so it's not so common anymore, but I wonder if it's still in the back of people's minds that nicotine must taste like tobacco. Doesn't, doesn't taste of anything. No. Um, I will um, uh, share the list. It's it's public now, so it can be shared. And um, the danger we see, and that's why I came here, uh, representing the Dutch uh, customers. Um, if the Netherlands adopts the flavor ban, um, all the other European countries will follow suit, just like the game of dominoes. Mm -hmm. Spain is waiting, and some other countries are just waiting for us to come out and try it out. And if it succeeds, then they will do it. And the only narrative they've got, because we fought them as hard as we could on every argument they had against nicotine and against vaping, and all the arguments were dead. And there's the one thing you know when they're up against the wall is when they begin complaining about the risk for children. It's mm -hmm. always been the same with every campaign. It's the children. Oh my God, it's the children. Mm -hmm. In the Netherlands, 0.04% of the smokers um, who are uh, are 18 years younger are vaping 0.4%. So we're protecting 0.04% mm. of youth vaping, and we throw 20,000 deaths yearly of smokers under the bus. Mm. It's it's uh, insane. Uh, <coughs> smokers, but uh, I insist also also youth uh, that will smoke. Uh, the, the thing we we. That is insane for me. Is uh, when you have public health experts that you take in front of you lying, saying science is false. When you've got decades of science, uh, I talk to experts uh, nicotine from multiple continents. All of them told some some elements some say and that science as well there are doubts on this effect or that effect or, or that positive or negative effect um but there are consensual uh, things about nicotine that are certain especially that it doesn't cause cancer uh, and when you get public health experts telling all the delegates of the cup that it causes cancer or it causes heart disease which is totally falls on a scene, like a hard science. What do you think of their role in the global field of public health? What else is wrong? And when they say, let's protect the kids, at least in countries like France, where we've got a lot of teens uh, smoking and not only tobacco, um, because in France we have a gateway effect, but from cannabis with tobacco to smoking cigarettes. Um, basically, we are throwing those teens under the bus. Yes, yes, Do, those teens that didn't smoke, if we let time, 25% of them will become uh, daily smokers. And that's an issue. And what's proposed for the moment won't get to a level where 5% or 2% or whatever uh, smoke. It's 
just not conceivable with the vectors, the data, the real indicators we have. Yeah. Quick word about the young and the children. Um, we had a, a scientific, in, uh, um, scient uh, a woman asking young kids about uh, about vaping, um, and she found out that the kids uh, at, at seven and eight class degree, uh, what you call it, grade, grade, they try <coughs> vaping, and she asked them why, and they said it's cool. It's cool to make clouds. It's cool to make circle on the table. Uh, she asked them two years later, are you still vaping? They said, no, that's stupid. And it's expensive. Hmm. But did you use nicotine? No, 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 no. We don't want nicotine. That's, that's dangerous. We, we just want to like to have fun with it. But two years later, they all quit. At the same time, they checked how many young people in Norway are smoking and it's 1.4 percent of the population between 16 and 24 are smoking. So let them let young young and the children smoke but they have to stay away from the vape that that's that's dangerous. What's uh, the sense? There's an interesting comparison uh, from a, a study a couple of years old now we, that compares the U.S. and the U.K. and Canada, I believe. But just, just looking at the U.S. and U.K. numbers, total teen nicotine use is almost identical. Yeah. And um, obviously the vaping rate at that time, this is yeah. two, two years ago, was higher. So in the US, the vaping rate was much higher um, and much lower in the UK. But the smoking rate among teens in the UK was three times higher than in the United States. And yes. So you look at that picture, the same amount of nicotine. By the way, there is new data now that shows that, uh, at least in the United States, the amount of nicotine consumed by teens is now less than half what it was. 20 years ago. Mm. We're, we're all in a panic about <laughs> this new generation addicted to nicotine and it's dropped by 50, 55% actually. Yeah. But the smoking yeah. rate among teens in the but UK is really... That's uh, one of the things I wanted to say was I'm really disappointed that more teens haven't tried vaping. <laughs> that would be illegal. That Richard. would be illegal of course, but yeah. rather than smoking. Because I, I live... Which is also illegal. Yes. Yeah, that's illegal too. But that when's that stop teens? If they want to get hold of something, they will. I mean, I live not too far from a school and it's on the route that the kids walk past mm -hmm. and I see far more of them smoking... Cigarettes. Yeah, actual oh. cigarettes oh. than I do vaping. There are You see the occasional one or two with an e-cig but the vast majority of them are actually smoking. And if they're going to do something, it's much better off if they could pick up vaping without nicotine, so much the better, because they mm. then wouldn't potentially become, I mean, I won't call it an addiction anymore because vaping, you're not addicted. It's, it's at worst a dependence like caffeine because there isn't really any harm outside of inhaling burning plant material. And some potential benefit that never gets but never counted gets in. counted, yes. I, I have one solution. If, if, you, if, if you're going to stop the young and the children from vaping, we can do, uh, like to do in, in, in Burma or, or, or in Tibet, close down the internet. <coughs> then it will stop the young and the children from waking. No, even that won't work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, it will, when you look at it from the outside. Yeah. yeah. But there's one thing I want to add, and then I um, want to pass the mic to Stefan next to me. Um, the flavor ban is there to protect the kids because the flavors 
attract the children. Uh, that's the narrative, at least. Like adults don't like flavors or something like that. Flavors attract adults. Yeah, too. Yeah. Um, and the strange thing mm -hmm. is, um, the teens um, that will pick up vaping because teens try everything. And the more it's forbidden, the more it's interesting yeah, to do yeah, it. Of course. Yeah. Course. And, and, and to. You can pick up cherry flavored small cigars in any tobacconist. Yeah. And in most supermarkets in the UK. And those are probably the worst thing you could possibly ever smoke. I, you know, the, the logic of that is is bizarre in so many ways. It's like you have, people have not, have not thought this through, right? So eight in 10 teens vape flavors in the United States. Okay. But eight in 10 liquids are flavored, yeah. right? So if manufacturers made bicycles and only, you know, eight in 10 bicycles are red, and it turns out that eight in 10 teens are riding red bicycles, would that imply that Red. The color red causes bicycle riding, you know, but it, no. So there's so it's a convoluted uh, thing. Um, Stefan, you wanted to, to speak and thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you. Uh, am I holding this right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey, well, I'm, I'm Stefan Matheson. I'm from Sweden. I run a paper called vapecolon.se. Uh, and um, I'm really here to just meet people, I think, within the tobacco harm reduction movement. Uh, and to ask a lot of questions because I try to write things. So yeah, I do have some questions. Uh, I wanted to. I, I, have, to I have to warn you that we we seem to have a, we can continue the conversation, yeah. but um, we're going to lose our Ethra feed in in three minutes. Three minutes two, in two minutes. So quickly then. <laughs> uh, I think w w what I hear when it comes to nicotine and youth use uh, and everything with nicotine. Uh, some people say this is a moral issue for for a lot of people within tobacco control and stuff like that. Um, but I, I do think that there's tonight. something else going on. Do you think? Uh, and I think it's rarely addressed okay. within the tobacco harm reduction movements as much as it should be. Is that who benefits from this narrative? Really, who benefits? If it's not a moral question, a moral issue, really, because you know that, that could be the case. But is there any industry or anything that actually benefits from this discussion? Like when it comes to nicotine, safety and all that? Um, is it the tobacco industry? Is it the pharmaceutical industry? Who's benefiting from this? Because I think that's a real important Follow issue. Follow the money. Okay. Follow the money, so, yeah. Let, yeah, let, let me just say, we're, we're gonna continue this conversation because it's, it's, uh, it's interesting and others may want to join. Um, and we're uh, just at the end of the feed into score uh, with our friends uh, uh, around the world. And we're, we're happy that you joined us and we're happy to join you. And, uh, and you know, we thank you for your contributions and your activism and your advocacy um, toward saving lives. And, uh, you know, these, these are, we can joke, we can, we can laugh, but these are very serious topics uh, on the other hand. And we have a lot of work ahead of us and we will win, uh, but it's going to take time. And so thanks again for joining us.